Thanks everybody for coming to today's uh, Milner Therapeutics uh, Institute seminar. We are very lucky to have George Milleraris with us today, who is the Prince Philip Professor of Technology in the Department of Engineering. Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk. It's going to be based around, I guess, George's interest in the development and transi transition of implantable and wearable devices to look at um, the interface with um, electronic activity in different tissues and the way that we can combine this kind of interdisciplinary engineering and biology together. So thank you very much, George, for coming along. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So we'll talk about uh, bioelectronic medicine and technology for it. I will first explain what bioelectronic medicine is and why it's in need of technology and then go through an overview of different um, things that happen at different stages of maturity, some that are already in the clinic, some that are on their way, and some that are a bit further uh, behind. Um, so let me start first with an engineer's view of what medicine is. And it has to do with um, the following concept. So our journey through life is mostly determined by the genetic makeup that we inherited. But there are factors that can accelerate the, uh, this journey. Uh, for example, a poor lifestyle, pathogens very much a la mode with the COVID pandemic. Accidents can send people to an early grave. In this context, medicine is the know-how and the technologies that we as humankind had developed to turn back the clock and cheat uh, uh, death as much as possible. How is that? practically implemented? What are the modes of intervention? A very classical one is pharmaceuticals. Um, again, very much a la mode with vaccines, which are used for prevention. Um, the administration of dopamine uh, to uh, uh, people who uh, have Parkinson's disease can help control the symptoms. It doesn't cure the, um, the disease, but controls the symptoms. And then an example of a curative outcome would be the administration of antibiotics that kill the agent that causes the disease and cures the patient. In the same vein, another classical mode of intervention is what I would call plumbing, is where you do surgery, radiotherapy, you go in and cut and burn and reconnect. Um, prophylactic mastectomy uh, uh, performed in people who are at risk of uh, uh, developing breast cancer is used for prevention. Symptoms control, an example is the uh, installation of a shunt between the uh, brain and the abdominal cavity um, in someone who suffers from hydrocephalus. It will not cure the um, condition, but it will drain the excess cerebrospinal fluid and help manage the symptoms. And then resection of a tumor before it has had the chance to metastasize can yield a curative outcome. Now, to this classical modes of intervention, there have been two new ones that were added rather recently. The first one is regenerative medicine, where you go into the body and add tissues. Um, this is, if you view this as a manufacturing process, this is an additive type of process as opposed to a subtractive one here. So the, um, the idea here, a, a good example here is the, um, um, the transplantation of stem cells in people who suffer from leukemia can have a curative outcome. In the same vein, bioelectronic medicine is a similar process where you go into the body and add now an electronic device that stimulates with electrical current different parts of the body and can be used, for example, for a preventative outcome. Don't know how many of you are into football. This was from, not last summer, the one before when the Euro was on. And a footballer from the uh, Danish national team collapsed uh, in the f on the field because he suffered cardiac arrest. And he's now fitted with this device. This is a cardiac, um, uh, cardioverter defibrillator that has leads, so this is implanted under the skin here on the, uh, the chest, with leads that go into the heart. It monitors the beating of the heart, and if the heart stops, then it will give it a high current pulse and get it to restart again, thereby preventing death from cardiac arrest. 
Having given that example, most of bioelectronic medicine uh, interventions today have to do with symptoms control. This is an example. It's a patient who suffers from tremor, which is a, a condition that's characterized by tremor of the extremities. And he has been fitted with a deep brain stimulation, which again has a little box that gets implanted under the skin of the chest, has the batteries and electronics, and then wires that connect to an implant that penetrates deep in the brain and stimulates the subthalamic nucleus. And by flicking a switch, the symptoms ameliorate to quite a, a, an impressive degree. So this type of intervention is used to help people uh, suffer from dystonia, Parkinson's disease, tremor. These are movement disorders. Also epilepsy, where it has been shown to decrease the severity and frequency of seizures. Neuropsychiatric disorders, OCD and depression is being tried for obesity and many more. So arguably all this goes back to the famous experiment of Galvan in the 18th century, dead frog, you apply an electric field, the legs twitch. This gave rise to lots of speculation about the nervous system. And then 200 years later, there were uh, treatments. This is a pacemaker about the year before it became fully implanted. And at that time, the patient had to carry that cart with them with batteries and electronics. 58 was the first implantation of a fully contained and implanted pacemaker. And today, we have this as the state of the art, a tiny little device that gets implanted into the heart uh, uh, completely leadless. So if you start the clock at 58, first fully implanted pacemaker to treat cardiac arrhythmias, um, there the site of intervention was right there on the, on the heart. Then a decade later, late 60s, we had cochlear implants for helping people with profound uh, deafness. A decade later, the 70s, you had spinal cord stimulators for uh, uh, helping folks who suffer from uh, chronic pain. Then a couple of peripheral nerve stimulation uh, uh, devices. Then the brain came to the forefront with deep brain stimulation for movement and neuropsychiatric disorders. And then it took off. Uh, many, many devices came out, approved by the FDA, not a comprehensive list here. The latest and greatest is nerve uh, cuffs, uh, stimulators that hold on to a peripheral uh, nerve branch and stimulated to help with autoimmune diseases. So Crohn's one, uh, sorry, Crohn's disease, type one diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis are all believed to be treatable with this uh, concept. It's gotten a lot of uh, publicity and even companies you wouldn't associate with bioelectronics uh, got into the game. A very well-known example, Google's parent company in GSK who launched Galvani Bioelectronics here at Stevenage, uh, envisioning treating disease, not through administration of uh, pharmaceuticals, but by having miniaturized implants on peripheral nerves. Yeah. And then since then, the founder of Tesla and SpaceX, the founder of Facebook, they all got into ventures with bioelectronics. As a result, there's also a lot of hype. If you see a Hollywood movie, there's always a bad, the bad guy who wears bioelectronic tentacles and tries to destroy civilization. It's never the, the good guy who, who does that. Um, but the reality is more like what you see here. This is a boy who wears a cochlear implant. This is a device that consists of two bits. The first one is external, and you see it here. It has a microphone that picks up the sound, some electronics here for processing, and then an antenna that radios the information to an implant in the inner ear that stimulates uh, um, nerve cells in the um, uh, cochlea, the hearing organ and gives rise to the sensation of hearing. And just look at the marvel in the eyes of this boy as he hears for the first time, thanks to that implant. So we're talking about life-changing technologies. Like any medical technology, it raises ethical issues. Here, they're compounded by the fact that we're acting on the organ that gives us sense of self, um, is the seat of consciousness, and, and so on. I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. It's very funny. 
and captures the very early years of um, uh, uh, after Galvani's uh, uh, experimentation shows the quintessential mad scientist trying to reanimate or galvanize, as it was called, the dead corpse by applying electricity um, in an ivory tower completely disconnected from society. Obviously not the way um, uh, forward. This is a, the cardioverter defibrillator that can um, uh, start the heart after a, a cardiac arrest. So how did we go from here to there through involving all the stakeholders uh, um, in the medical device space? First and foremost, patients and their advocates, clinicians, um, industry, uh, ethicists, regulators. It's a big and complex environment and everybody should be involved at the very early stages of medical device uh, technology development. So, so far I painted a very optimistic uh, picture. Uh, where is it? Why don't we see it deployed at, at scale? There are some formidable challenges. First and foremost, we do not understand how the brain works. It's a very complex machine. The human brain consists of over 80 billion neurons and then 10 times as many uh, 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 glia and astrocytes and all that. Each neuron is connected to as many as 1,000 others, so the numbers are astronomical. It's like looking up in the uh, heavens and trying to figure out how the universe uh, works. Um, we do understand quite a lot of things about how neurons communicate with each other. We know that neurons are electrically active cells. They have a cell body processes that we call dendrites that collect information. This information gets compiled, and the outcome is an action potential, which is like a little voltage pulse that travels down the axon, and then arrives at the synapse, which is the space where this neuron comes very close to that one. When the action potential arrives here, it releases neurotransmitter that then either stimulates or inhibits the postsynaptic neuron. So these are things that we understand to a reasonable degree of sophistication. What we do not understand is how we go from these um, cellular phenomena to microscopic behavior. To close this gap, electrophysiologists use electrodes in different configurations to start filling in the, um, uh, the blanks. For example, with implantable electrodes that are stereotactically placed on the brain, you can look at the chatter of individual neurons. Then you go to cortical electrodes that sit at the surface of the brain and you record larger networks. And then from outside the, um, uh, the skull, on the scalp, you can measure larger networks of networks uh, type of information. Um, but again, given the complexity of the problem, we're only beginning to scratch the surface. The opposite is also not understood. What is the mechanism of neuromodulation? Why, when we um, stimulate with an electrode, we change uh, microscopic behavior such as tremor, for example? Now, these limitations that are fundamental go hand in hand with technological limitations that are quite severe. And if there is one thing you retain from my talk today is this, that new technologies are urgently needed in order to establish a stable and effective interface with tissue. That is what is holding us back from being able to understand the brain and deploying more technologies. So what I want to do for the uh, rest of the talk is to give you a sense of where we stand in terms of new technology. And it is a bit like peeling an onion. There are challenges that you solve and then another one arises and so on and so forth. So let's lift the, uh, the hood and peer into the uh, engine now. The first issue that you uh, are faced with is the fact that tissues are soft and they move. The brain has the consistency of jello, while electronics as we know them are made out of mechanically stiff materials. If you open your computer, you will find a, a printed circuit board made out of a quite hard plastic with components attached to it. Those components are made out of 
inside they have silicon, they have metals, very stiff materials. Um, the brain also jiggles inside the skull, pulsates due to blood flow, so you're trying to hit the proverbial uh, moving target. So this necessitated development of whole new generation of technology. Two examples shown here. The first one is by John Rogers at the time at uh, University of Illinois, who developed ultra-thin electronics that can conform to the topo topography of the brain. So um, this is the um, a, a brain, and as you see, it's not flat. It has curvature. It's curvilinear. And by making electronics very thin, you can follow that topography in a tattoo-like fashion. This is very similar to this children's temporary tattoo where it's, uh, you have a, a, a tattoo deposited on a piece of paper, you wet it, you put it on the skin, it transfers the tattoo, and then you discard the paper. So as thin and as conformal as that. Stephanie Lapour from EPFL took this a step further by using elastomeric materials that not only conform, but also stretch as the body moves. For example, in uh, places such as the spinal cord, where there is a lot of motion, using those stretchable, now electronics, allows you to maintain contact while the um, animal or the human uh, behaves. This took over a decade um, to, uh, to troubleshoot, but now we do have the technology to hold a good mechanical contact. The next issue was to establish good communication, bidirectional communication with tissues. And an issue is that signals are very small and diverse. What do I mean by that? When the neuron fires an action potential, there are small metal ions, sodium, potassium, that go in and out of the membrane. And these represent ionic currents that you can measure and know that this neuron has fired. However, they're very weak. They're extremely small in a sea of lots of other things happening. In addition to small metal ions, there are neurotransmitters, there are hormones, there are even exosomes, bits of cells that get exchanged during neuronal communication. So you have diverse signals, and you need a lot of different techniques to be combined in order to, uh, um, um, to get a better understanding of this phenomenon. So here is one example of how you interface with small signals. I'm not going to go through the details. If you have a metal electrode, such as one made out of platinum, a platinum foil, um, and you put it in the brain, you're going to end up having a, a, a wet environment here, the cerebrospinal fluid, <coughs> into which you have ions. And then at the other side, inside the electronic material, you have electrons. So when, the, when neurons fire in the brain, <coughs> these ions will be set to motion. And their motion will be mirrored by these electronic charges because they couple to each other electrostatically. And what you detect is the motion of this electronic charge inside your metal electrode. However, this coupling along the electrode surface is very weak. Um, and that is not suitable for measuring small signals. So you need to make fairly large electrodes to be able to uh, decipher the, the dance of these ions. And that limits spatial resolution. However, if you use materials such as conducting polymers, um, ions can penetrate into the volume of your electrode and couple volumetrically with electronic charge. This allows you to strengthen the handshake between ionic and electronic signals and allows you to make very small electrodes that work extremely efficiently. Electrodes as small as tens of microns, um, so the size of the soma of a neuron, um, that are interfaced with very thin, flexible uh, uh, plastics that are conformal to the brain. And these electrodes have been translated in the clinic. So 
This is the state of the art today. Um, these are electrodes that are used to monitor the brain before surgery. They're made out of platinum discs that are about five millimeter in diameter. Here they're shown placed under the dura after a craniotomy. And with the technology of conducting polymers, you can go to much smaller and thinner electrodes, about 10 microns in diameter. So a couple of orders of magnitude increase in spatial resolution, <clears throat> and you can fit hundreds of electrodes in the same area. So better localization of tissue that needs to be resected, better understanding of um, how the brain works. Another issue with bioelectronics is that surgery is invasive to put a, a, a device in the body. Um, an example is spinal cord stimulation. This is, as I mentioned earlier, an established neuromodulation technique for treating chronic pain. Um, started in the 70s. And the idea is that you implant an electrode array on the spinal cord and you tickle with electric current. And if you get the um, frequency of this uh, signal right, then you can scramble the painful sensation and replace it with something much more agreeable. There are two technologies here. The predominant one is what is called a percutaneous array. It's a linear array of electrodes that can be placed up on the spinal cord through the space between vertebrae. So this is done by an anesthesiologist that will feel the space between vertebrae, insert a needle, and then snake in this array. Similar to how you would do an epidural injection or a spinal tap. Um, unfortunately, this device can fall out of position. As you know, someone bends over to uh, tie their shoelaces, the device might move and not be able to deliver um, uh, stimulation at the point where stimulation is needed. And this requires revision placement and, and uh, um, it's not an optimal uh, condition. Another technology is this two-dimensional puddle that is placed on the spinal cord. This is a much better device because it addresses a larger fraction of the spinal cord and you can always find the appropriate location to stimulate. Um, as a result, you can minimize uh, side effects. You have a much larger window to play with. Plus, it holds a really good contact and doesn't come out of alignment. Unfortunately, it requires a laminectomy to place. That means you need to remove part of the vertebrae to place the device in and then put it back in. And this immobilizes the patient at the hospital for a couple of days, holds the hospital bed occupied, so it has that disadvantage. So here we took inspiration from the field of soft robotics or soft uh, pneumatically activated robotics. This is shown, uh, an example of this is shown here. This is a, a rubbery object that changes shape when compressed fluid is applied to it. That fluid can be air. As a result of the change of shape here, it crawls forward, but the big picture is the change of shape upon pneumatic actuation. This is work by uh, George Whiteside's uh, group at Harvard. So thinking of how this can help in the uh, spinal cord uh, stimulation field, we integrated this thin electrode arrays with microfluidic channels so that then the device can be rolled up to the shape of a percutaneous array, um, as shown here. It can be inserted in the spinal cord through a, a, a needle, no laminectomy required, and then expanded post uh, insertion. So the concept is shown here. So you would insert the needle, put the device up, and then use the fluidic to expand it. 
Um, so this is it in human cadavers. That's the needle that uh, is used to insert the device. It is done under a fluoroscope that can uh, guide the, uh, the placement and the expansion. And then once the device is placed at the appropriate location, it can be expanded by a handheld syringe with a little bit of uh, uh, air or a, um, or a fluid. Um, so this is the needle. That's a device that comes out of the needle. It has two markers, x-ray markers above and beyond. Um, uh, the top and bottom part. So when, it, um, when it's rolled up, they coincide, and then they begin to separate as you deploy the device. So here it's pushed up the uh, spinal cord, and then here the deployment begins, and you can monitor the expansion by looking at the markers. Um, you can also then do a laminectomy. Um, this is where the device was injected. This is where it is. You can find it and see that it nicely hugs the uh, spinal cord. This and that are the two markers that um, are used to make it visible to, uh, to X-ray. So this is now um, has taken the translation pathway um, and also the commercialization pathway with the help of uh, Cambridge Enterprise. Final thing I want to talk about is the foreign body reaction, which is um, something that happens when you implant um, a foreign object into the body. So in the context of the brain, the brain will uh, uh, build a glial scar and insulate the device electrically from the rest of the brain. And that causes um, inefficiencies in communication. For example, in deep brain stimulation, um, you start by applying just a few volts are necessary to pass the required current to stimulate the brain. And as the glial scar builds up, you need to up and up and up the voltage, and this drains the battery faster. A concept that's out there for uh, decreasing the, um, or uh, uh, getting away uh, without any foreign body uh, response is the so-called living electrode concept. So the idea is that you have your electrode then you put that conducting polymer layer on top that will give you a better interface with biology. This is the, the layer where ions can penetrate and couple with uh, electrons. But you also put a layer of a gel with living cells in it. And then you implant the whole uh, construct. And you hope that this layer camouflages your electronics when they're inside the body. So the body sees living cells and decides not to attack your implant. But in addition, you might hope that the tissue you bring into the body connects with native tissue or gets innervated by native tissue, thereby giving you a stronger um, interface between your implant and uh, your host. I'm very excited about this concept because in a sense it bridges these two modalities. You're bringing into the body not only tissues, but also electronics. And it's at the confluence of these two fields. Now, if you view this from the um, uh, uh, standpoint of regenerative medicine, um, having electronics with your tissue engineered construct will help uh, monitor the integration of that tissue, even control it and steer it one way or another, um, and um, help you interface uh, better with, uh, with the body. If you view this from bioelectronic medicine point of view, um, not only you avoid the foreign body response, but also you can lead to a better interface with tissue as you are able now to do local repair. In bioelectronics, often you put electrodes in tissue that's compromised by disease or injury. And being able to use tissue engineered component to do some local repair can help give you a better outcome. A question is, where do the cells come from? Here we rely on a collaboration with uh, Mark Cotter and his company, Pete Bio, who developed very uh, facile ways of forward programming uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells 
to different somatic cell types. So the idea is that you would take cells from a patient, bring them to um, a stem cell uh, state, and then program them to the tissue that you require on top of your electrodes, and then implant the, um, uh, the, the construct uh, for repair. Um, what you see here is the uh, formation of myocytes and then myotubes, so striated muscle that um, is basically this step. You started with uh, a couple of uh, stem cells and then you form really nice muscle tissue on top of the, uh, of the device. And this is a process that takes about 10 days. So to prove this concept, we work on a, a peripheral nerve injury model. And what we did is to um, culture these uh, cells on top of a device. This is done ex vivo, initiate the process of differentiation. A couple of days later, we have this muscle, uh, a layer of muscle tissue formed on the device, which is then implanted on the transected nerve at the proximal to the brain uh, end. And what we hope to achieve is that the uh, transected motor neuron actions innervate the muscle. So when the brain sends a command to move uh, the muscle, this command comes down the actions and triggers twitching in these muscles that is then picked up with these electrodes. That's one part of the interface. And then you use an equivalent device on the muscle to get the uh, muscle to execute this motion. So that would be a bypass for injuries of the uh, peripheral uh, nerve. So here I'll talk about the first uh, bit, the recording bit as shown here. Um, the surgery is pretty straightforward here. You might see the array with electrodes that is sutured on the, uh, on the nerve. The first thing you want to show is that the cells survive the process and um, they are contained in a gel that contains the appropriate factors that keep them alive during the, um, the, the, the shock of transplantation. You can do um, histology uh, uh, a couple of weeks after implantation and see that starting from your electrode into the tissue you have about 30 microns worth of um, cells that have survived the implantation. This is about the thickness of the gel that we uh, put on the, the device. Then you look at um, whether the device helps the severed nerve. If you just take an array of electrodes and place it on a severed nerve, um, you will not be able to record any activity because this part of the nerve will die. Um, so as you try to record here while you stimulate the nerve, you only record the stimulation artifact. However, if you put tissue, if you have muscle on your device, and then you attach it on the severed nerve, you will measure this characteristic signal, which is similar to the naive uh, signal you measure with a hook electrode if you stimulate the nerve. So the conclusion is that the biohybrid device uh, maintains uh, the, the, the health of the nerve while just a, a, an array of electrodes will not. And then this is spontaneous activity that you measure as the animal behaves. Week one to four, week one, week two, you don't record much. You expect at least three weeks for this innervation to take place. And then indeed after week three, you start seeing some signal. And week four, you get very clear muscle type of recording, so myogram uh, uh, signal, um, uh, which is uh, spontaneous. And what you can do is you can take this signals and stretch them up, normalize them to one, and correlate them with behavior. So the bars here show 
uh, when the animal was moving. And again, signals from week one to week four normalize now to have the same amplitude. And you're looking for correlation between behavior and uh, electrophysiology. That's only becoming uh, significant uh, after uh, week three. So at week four, you start seeing that you have this innervation. Very exciting results that show that this hybrid type of electrode, the living electrode concept, um, uh, uh, works and it preserves the, uh, the health of the system, enables local repair, and yields very high quality signals to be uh, recorded. So with that, I'll close the, the talk. Uh, bioelectronic medicine provides novel ways to prevent disease and to treat uh, their symptoms. The technological challenge is to establish a stable and effective interface between electronics and tissue. This is what limits currently um, uh, the field. I show you two new ideas. One is that the interface with soft robotics can provide solutions that reduce the invasiveness of surgery. This was in the context of spinal cord, but you can think the same for the brain, a little burr hole you put in a device and then you expand it to cover the surface of the brain. Um, another one is the interface with the regenerative medicine. This is, in my view, a, a very promising idea because it combines two modalities uh, for practicing medicine and paves the way to curative uh, outcomes. So with that, let me thank the team. Um, the lab is co-led by Damiano Barone, a neurosurgeon, and Alex Carnicer uh, Lombarte, who's a neuroscientist. Lots of people from anywhere from uh, neurosurgery to um, physics and chemistry and the continuum uh, between the two. Collaborations with many people uh, at Cambridge. I showed you data that were obtained with uh, Gabby Kaminsky, chemical engineering, and Mark Cotter in clinical neurosciences. And then some alumni that left and started their, uh, their own groups. So that's it. Thank you for your attention and thank you for the invitation.